Right. So, welcome everybody to the uh, afternoon session here at Lodays. Uh, I'm Peter, and I will be telling you a story about DNS, about extended DNS, and what is going to happen in uh, next February. So, little layout. So, what's all this stuff about? I'm going to tell you about. So, I am. I won't say the word cloud. I won't say the word YAML. I, 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 won't, I won't mention any, any configuration management. So. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is administration, right? So I will tell you a little bit about DNS uh, because uh, you might need some uh, refreshing course on what it actually is. I will then tell you what eDNS actually is, uh, what kind of shit there is on the internet uh, regarding eDNS. Uh, I will then tell you what we're going to do to force proper eDNS compliance and then what you can do to actually make sure that uh, your domains stay in the air. So, who am I? Uh, Peter, I'm, uh, my official title is Senior Power DNS Engineer, whatever that may be. I uh, train as a sysadmin, I write C++ and Python for the Power DNS project, and I do all their testing, building, packaging automation, uh, and other sysadmin stuff that, uh, that comes with it. And if you ever need the latest version of PowerDNS, we have our own repositories for uh, CentOS and uh, Debian and Ubuntu. So there is no reason to ever run an old version. So PowerDNS, uh, we're an open source company founded in 1999 during the height of the dot-com bubble. Uh, we've been doing open source since 2002. Uh, we've been bought by the Open Exchange Company in 2015. And we do all the commercial support, uh, deployment and development of the PowerDNS open source products and some. Uh, PowerDNS platform, which is a commercial offering. So what's all this about? Um, the last couple of years, uh, the resolver operators and resolver writers have seen a lot of brokenness on the internet. And uh, DNS is a, it's a finicky protocol. There are a bunch of new things stacked on top of it. And, and some have interactions, some don't. And we said, this is enough. We are attempting to make the internet work better so we can actually evolve the protocol, evolve the internet. Uh, so we, we have a coordinated effort now by the open source DNS vendors to reduce the code complexity in our code uh, and to improve the health of the whole DNS system in general. Uh, we will do this by removing certain workarounds that we have now in the code to force operators of uh, domain names, so hosters, to get their stuff in order so we can evolve and make the product or make the, the platform even better. Uh, and the first step we're going to do is to remove eDNS related uh, workarounds from the name servers. So who is doing all this? Uh, it's the uh, guys from ISC uh, that make the bind uh, name server. It's CZNIC uh, of the NOT resolver. A and the NSD, uh, sorry, the not uh, name server. It's the NL NetLab guys who make Unbound and the NSD server. And then there's us, we make the PowerDNS recursor and the PowerDNS authoritative server. So why are we doing this? Like I said, our resolvers have become unwieldy. There are loads and loads of, of, of code paths that deal with broken packets that come back in uh, to see, hey, is, is this really uh, is this really a proper answer? Maybe we should retry it with some other options, or maybe we should try uh, a different packet and see if we actually get an answer from this authoritative server. And there are many incompatible hosted hosting name servers on the internet. Uh, what incompatible means, I will explain later. Uh, but these cause cause our pain. We just have to write so much stuff around it. And like I said, this is probably a prelude to the future, where we are going to remove more workarounds for for brokenness on the internet to just force a, a more healthy, healthy environment. So, how many of you run DNS servers here? Wonderful. How many of you know the basics of DNS? Okay, then this will be very quick. Good. So, DNS, it's super old. The original idea stems from 79 uh, in a standard known as IEN 116, which, is, which predates all the RFCs. Then the first DNS was standardized in 83. Who, who was born after 83? Born in 83. Yeah. <laughs> I was also born after. Was born yeah. No. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it is, it is. For, for, for something on the internet, it is super old. Um, 
The current standard uh, is from 87, uh, which is the one that, uh, that, that is currently uh, still in operation today. And the entire DNS actual standard without any additional things spans 92 documents and 1600 pages. So getting that right is, is hard. Uh, if you find all this stuff fascinating, uh, Bert Hubert, uh, the, my boss, he has made the Hello DNS page, uh, which gives you a very nice protocol overview, and it's uh, shh, and it's rather simple, uh, simply written to to get a full grasp of of how all these standards interact and what the DNS is all about. Uh, so DNS, it is in essence quite simple. It's a query response protocol. I send out a query, and hopefully a response comes in with an answer or with uh, what is known as a delegation, or maybe a, hey, this name does not exist, everything is further OK. Uh, it maps a tree of names, uh, which is a proper uh, computer science tree. So the root is at the top, and it goes down, uh, to arbitrary data. Um, usually, it's, uh, people call it the phone book of the internet. Uh, every time you say that, a few kittens die. Uh, the yellow, uh, yellow page is also the thing is it do does not only map uh, names to addresses, it can map to any arbitrary data. Uh, you probably know the TXT records used for site validation, etc. Uh, it, it maps so IPv6 addresses, of course. You have uh, some service discovery things in there. Hmm? Yes, yes. <laughs> and it has crypto material nowadays as well. Yes. Oh, it actually works. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have seen things. Uh, Trent? Yeah. So, you could. No, I, I, I am not going to answer this question. Um, transport is usually UDP TCP protocol 50, uh, port 53, but other transports exist, like uh, DNS over TLS exists, DNS over HTTP 2 is uh, being developed now, and yeah? So, it's, it, and uh, people are just trying the weirdest things. And, um, it is potentially the most fundamental protocol that we still have uh, on the internet because nothing happens without the DNS, or almost nothing happens, unless you want to remember every IP address ever. So how do messages flow? So this is super simplified. You have a program that needs to have an, uh, that, that has a name that wants an address. It will call some uh, libc function to a local stop resolver, which may or may not be a full DNS stack uh, that that forwards it might be even a uh, a DNS stack validating uh, resolver that just forwards it might even be the resolver itself doesn't uh, it it just comes there and the stop resolver will most of the time contact a recursive resolver which is somewhere in the network uh, usually the one in your modem at home or uh, in the company's uh, stack of, uh, of of things that they have to to make your uh, your life better uh, or at your ISP. And this recursive resolver has a cache. If the, if the answer you want is not in the cache, it will go out to the so-called authoritative servers that actually serve the zone data. And uh, hopefully you'll, in the end, get an answer. So when you're looking at DNS, uh, the protocol as packets, the query and the responses use the exact same packet format. Uh, whereas, for instance, with HTTP, it's just a TCP connection where you do some plain text uh, back and forth, and only the the, the first part, the, the header is is, qu is specified. Although you can add way more stuff in there. In DNS, it is it is fixed. There is the the header is specified, and there is no way you can do anything about it. Uh, total packet, it's the header. There's a, a a question section which contains the question. There is an answer section which contains or may contain the answer. There's an authority section which will have some records saying, OK, uh, these are the names. Let me just. Yeah, OK. Uh, which will list the most, most of the time, the name servers responsible for uh, the domain you're querying. And there's an additional section where you can put yeah, almost anything you want, uh, which will hopefully be ignored on the other side. So uh, what the packet header looks like, you have a ID field, which is used to map a query to an answer. Uh, if you do it well, you also have the source port randomized. Otherwise, it's very easy to spoof uh, this information coming back. You have a flag saying, this is a query or this is a response. You have an opcode, which usually 
is uh, the, the query opcode, but you have something like DNS update, uh, then the opcode is different. You have a flag that says, oh, by the way, this answer comes from a real authority. Then you have a flag, oh yeah, sorry, I couldn't fit any, uh, I couldn't fit everything in the packet, so this is truncated. Uh, you have the RD flag which says, oh, I, uh, uh. Uh, that's usually sent out in a query that says, I want recursion, so if you send this to a recursor, it will go out to the internet for you. If you don't set this flag, it will just look in its cache, usually. If it doesn't have the answer, it will tell you. Nope, nothing here. Uh, you have the RA, which is recursion available. So a recursor will, in the response packet, set this bit if it will allow recursion for you. Then there is one flag which is not specified yet. Woohoo! Uh, then there's the AD flag that is used for DNSSEC to, that will tell you, yes, this data is super valid. I have validated it for you. <laughs> it's, you, you can believe me. I, I have set this to one. It is awesome. Sir? Is there a signature on this bit? No, there is not. <laughs> <laughs> That's the this is what makes it awesome. And uh, then there's the CD, the checking disabled flag, uh, that's usually used if you forward to a validating uh, resolver, but also want to validate yourself, that you don't get an answer saying, oh, I couldn't validate, but you actually get the data. And you have a four bits of response code, uh, which allows the responder to tell you, hey, something's wrong or everything is okay. And then you have a bunch of fields that will tell you how many questions there are, how many answers there are, how many uh, authority records there are, and how many additional records exist. Uh, we have some common, common response code. Uh, the no error is, yeah, uh, here, here's your answer, everything is fine. Um, interestingly, no error is also set if you ask for a name and a type in the DNS, but the type does not exist, but the name does. So you get a packet back which is where the answer is empty, but you also have no error. Uh, and once you, when you parse this packet, you have to figure out, ah, okay, that's no error, but the answer section is empty. Okay, so that does mean that the name exists, but there is no data. Uh, it's, it's kind of a weird quirk. There's form error, which just means, yeah, you send me a packet and I cannot parse it, go away, or try it again. Uh, there's a serve fail, it says, oh yeah, I fucked up, or something else fucked up down the line, but I cannot do anything about it. Or, yeah, I couldn't validate your DNSSEC, and uh, well, that, that's it. That's the only thing it will tell you. Uh, you have annex domain, which says, well, I, 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 I was looking for your answer. I did not find the name that you were looking for. So if I look for example.com and the name does not exist, you get annex domain. But if I look for example.com txt, and the txt record does not exist, but example.com a, for instance, does exist, so the IP address exists, you get a no data answer. Super, super nice to implement all this. Uh, you have not imp, which stands for not implemented, which means you've sent me a query with an opcode that I don't know, so I will just ignore it. And you have refused, uh, which will tell you, I won't do what you tell me because for whatever policy reason, uh, I, I won't do it. And then there's a bunch of others. So these are usually used in the normal DNS space. And also, if you do DNS updates, there are like an, a bunch of other, uh, of other codes. So from all this, there are a bunch of observations you can make about traditional DNS. Uh, there are only 16 possible R codes, of which 11 are already assigned. Uh, one flag in the, in the whole header of the packet is not defined. This is the only part of the whole, of the whole header that has no meaning. The rest, every bit is accounted for in the spec. Um, another thing in DNS, if you do UDP, the specification says you can have no packets larger than 512 bytes. And that's the whole packet, that is including the header. Uh, there is no way for any name server to another name server to signal what kind of capabilities it has or uh, what, what additional processing it can do. And the packet format is is fixed and it is very, very rigid. So, any questions so far? Wonderful. So, then you come to eDNS. Who has ever heard of eDNS? Okay, good. N not as many as know the DNS. So, eDNS, uh, it stands for Extension Mechanisms for DNS. Uh, the RFC has this nice quote, uh, which basically says, well, it is a way to ensure we can expand on the capabilities of the, of the domain name system. And it is backwards compatible, <laughs> or so they thought at that time, with, uh, with the DNS. And it will allow the DNS to gain more features without, uh, without making uh, name servers that do not support these features broken. 
So it is, just like DNS, quite old. So the first eDNS, or eDNS0 uh, specification, comes from 1999, which is about the year that PowerDNS was launched. Um, it was updated in 2013, and um, in this time, um, a bunch of other specifications came. Uh, one of the uh, uh, technologies that uses eDNS is, for instance, DNSSEC, and it came somewhere here in the, in the middle. Well, actually, it came a little bit before, but... Um, so, how does it work? In the most simple terms, a requester, so the name server sending out a packet, adds a record to the additional section of the query that states some information which I will go into later. Um, if the responder does not understand this, it must return a form error, like, I don't understand this packet. This is old school DNS. This is, this is, this is the specification from 1987 that says, if you don't understand it, just send back a format error. Um, if the responder does understand eDNS, it must put uh, a similar record in the additional section, signaling, hey, I understand eDNS, we can do more advanced things. Um, but as this is DNS, we try to make the, everything as compact as possible. So what do they do? How, how, what does the record look like? The name of the record in the packet is root domain. So you have one byte there. Uh, the type uh, is always 16-bit, uh, is always um, specified as 41. It's known as opt optional. Um, the class field, which you usually know as IN, Internet class, uh, for nearly any, uh, any DNS deployment, uh, we use that to set a UDP buffer size. So a requester can send out a packet with this additional record in there, telling the responder, hey, by the way, 512 bytes, it's way too little. You can send me 4K bytes. Uh, and because this is a 16-bit field, it will allow you to get 64K of data in a response, which is usually dropped by some intermediate device because fragmented, uh, fragmented packets don't count. Then the TTL field, they split this up just, just to save on, on data. You have eight bits, which is specified as the upper bits in the R code. So we have now a 12-bit R code, of which eight bits are somewhere on the other side of the packet and not in the header. <laughs> then we have eight bits specifying the eDNS version, which is specified as a zero. And then we have 16 bits left, and these are for flags. Just specify them, doesn't matter. Uh, and then there's the actual record data, which is known as eDNS options. Um, so what kind of technologies uh, are using eDNS? So like I said, DNSSEC, it uses the DO flag in the, in the eDNS packet. Uh, in the, interestingly, it is the, of, of all the bits that we still have, so there are 16 bits, so 16 more flags that we can uh, use. Only one is specified, and that is the DNSSEC OK bit, which allows you to signal, hey, I want DNSSEC records. Uh, then uh. On, the, on the option end, there are like a bunch of, uh, of DNS, uh, eDNS options that almost nobody uses. Uh, you have NSID, which is actually a very handy one. It allows you to figure out the name of the name server in a cluster. So you send out a query with the NSID option. And if the other side understands you, it will add its name to the, to the return packet, saying, I, uh, I am DNS 15-2 dot domain, or some, some opaque name. You have client subnet, used for CDN networks mostly. It will, uh, a recursor will send it out to the uh, authoritative server, for instance, Cloudflare or Akamai, and will tell you, hey, I am asking you this question, but don't look at my source address to figure out the best place to send me to. I'm actually sending this on behalf of this network. Uh, this will allow CDNs to steer traffic to the closest point where, uh, where, the, where the originator of the, of the question actually is. Uh, you have DNS cookies which is a security mechanism for, uh, for more transaction security. Um, and you have chain queries, which everybody just ignores because it's super weird. <laughs> so wh what does it look like? I uh, hope this is readable in the back. OK, all right. I will put the slides up later so you can, you can have a look. So if I uh, just use dig to send a query for www.powerdns.com, I set the DO bit, so the DNSSEC OK. 
Uh, it will tell me, well, this is the normal DNS header I get in the, in the reply. So the opcode is query, the status is no error, the transaction ID, some number. These are all the flags that I got. So this is a response because it is set. Uh, this, this server has, uh, I wanted recursion in the original query. This server says, oh, I, I, I support recursion for you. And it has the AD bit set because this answer is validated, so it must be good. Uh, and then it says, well, there's one entry in the query section, two answers, no authority. And there's one additional record, which is the opt record. Um, so this one was sent with EDNS version 0. The flag was set to DO, uh, indicating from the responders end, yes, I can do DNSSEC for you. And the responder also says, oh, yeah, I can do, uh, I can do 40, 96 uh, bytes of data in a packet. Uh, so if I use options, what does that look like? Well, again, I send a query out this time to um, one of our public name servers. And uh, I tell it, well, uh, I set the NSID uh, option. I get an, uh, an, an, uh, an opt record back, so I get an EDNS packet back. It says, well, this is the NSID, which is just a binary blob, and dig helpfully makes a string out of this. So if you have a huge cluster and... and you get weird answers, you can try to, uh, for instance, you have multiple implementations, like you have PowerDNS and not running, and you get different answers, you can actually figure out which one of them gives which answer at that point, even though it is like one Anycast IP with a bunch of stuff behind it. So what are the things, what are the issues that we see with eDNS on the current internet? Um, we have seen when sending out a packet with, uh, with eDNS in there, we get a wrong R code. So we get a no, not implemented R code or a surf fill R, R code. Um, we get a packet back that does not have an opt record in the response, which is also forbidden, but it doesn't send form error. So what you're going to do? Um, even worse implementations will just copy the whole opt record and just send it back in the, in the response, uh, which has led to different new uh, or with new options, DNSSEC uh, eDNS options, adding a bit in their option saying, yeah, yeah, if you respond, you need to flip this bit because otherwise the requester cannot know this was a response, even though we already have a query response flag in the normal header. But there are so many broken implementations, we just change the spec to make sure it works. Uh, whereas the specification is pretty clear. If you do not implement eDNS, which is still quite possible on the internet, uh, unless you want to do DNSSEC, you must send form error if there is an opt record in there. Super easy, but people don't do this. So many of the open source vendors get all of most of these things right, uh, but many of the um, things that you get from a commercial vendor or uh, the black boxes you just plug in get get this wrong. Or people run real custom custom software, which you should never do. You should never write your own name server ever. Uh, what other things have we seen? So really weird broken responses. So we send an EDNS query. We don't get any response. Is the name server dead? Uh, did it not respond because it doesn't understand EDNS? Uh, do we want to try again without EDNS? But what if we try without EDNS and this is a DNS sign domain? We suddenly won't get signatures from the other end and then we validate and then everything breaks down. Um, we get a response but the packet is incomplete and there is no truncation flag set. Should we retry? Is the server on the other end broken? Should we just try another server for the same domain? You don't know. Uh, we send a non-EDNS uh, query and the response comes back with EDNS. What am I going to do with this? I didn't ask for this. Maybe I cannot even uh, process EDNS in, my, in, the, in the response packets. Uh, many of these things that we see happen because of firewalls, smart filters, middle boxes uh, that just say, ah, this doesn't look like real DNS, so I'll just either drop the packet, truncate the packet, or do some other weird stuff with it. Again, the spec says, conform with middle boxes must not limit DNS messages over UDP to 512 bytes. Uh, many of the commercial firewalls still do this, just as blocking TCP port 53, because ah, nobody uses that for DNS. So some, some other things that we see when handling unknown parameters. Uh, we have seen unknow unknown eDNS options being echoed back to us. Uh, we have seen, if we send out an eDNS query with version 0, everything is fine. 
But if we don't send it with version 0, we, get, we, don't, we do not get the bad version response back. We just get nothing or garbage or an answer with EDNS version set to, set to 1 as well. But that's because I don't understand, so I just, I just reply with everything I have. And, and also, like weird R codes or no, just no responses when we, when we send an EDNS option that is not understood. Uh, again, the spec is very clear. I, for this presentation, I've read it multiple times, and it's, it's one of the more clearer specifications on, uh, on, D, on DNS, I must say. It's also not that long. Um, so what kind of workarounds exist? Well, I already told a little bit about it. Uh, they are relatively easy when you think about them. So we can retry another server in this zone. So you usually have two or more servers serving the same zone. We're just going to try the other one and declare this one broken. We can also say, well, we, maybe we can retry without EDNS because we're not sure if this response means that the server is broken or that it just does not understand EDNS properly. Uh, but which one do we have to pick? When do we have to pick it? Um, every, every choice you make here slows down resolution for the, for the end user. And um, how can we detect, based on the response, what the actual issue was? It, it's super hard. And we're not going to take it. It's, it's, it just sucks. So how are we, as open source vendors, going to attempt to force these eDNS compliance? So the why. Well, like I said, DNS is complex. There's a lot of interaction between features. There is already too much complexity. Uh, eDNS is 19, or if you count from the, the latest RFC, six years old. And w we don't want to deal when we're adding more and more new features to the DNS servers to deal with broken servers and have other workarounds for other things. So uh, together with the guys from CZNIC, ISC, and Anonet Labs, uh, we have decided that starting February 2019, all releases from our uh, recursive products will not contain any of these workarounds anymore on the eDNS level. Uh, that means that some name servers or that some domains might go dark, might be slow, as we're not going to retry. Uh, but we reach out to you guys who actually run these domains to tell you what you can do uh, to, to fix this or to check. So what can you do? So the first one is super easy. Just run up-to-date software. Uh, I know in the CentOS world it might be a little bit hard. But uh, many of the vendors, uh, open source vendors, will help you getting, uh, get this correct. Um, so bind, uh, the bind people have told us, yeah, all, all versions of bind 9 are fine, but really try to run 9.12 and, uh, and later. Uh, the not people said, well, all versions are fine because they are super specific when they, when they type in their code. Uh, NSD, initial release, uh, is also good. So these are all authoritative servers. Uh, PowerDNS, uh, 4.0 and up. Uh, also, everything below 4 is not supported anymore, so if you run old stuff, then please upgrade. We have, we have packages. Um, um, so that is on the resolver side. Uh, the, so the Unbound will remove the workarounds, uh, and a DNS mask is more of a forwarder. Uh, we will attempt to either push patches or request, uh, request that they are rem uh, these workarounds are removed, but we, I don't think... DNS mask has this much uh, eDNS e info in there. Hmm? Um, systemd is also just a forwarder, so it shouldn't do this much uh, as well. But uh, knowing systemd, it could it could mean anything, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so most uh, most older versions of bind will work. Uh, older versions of not will just keep working. Uh, but it's it's important to check, and if not, attempt to upgrade. That is that is the that is the best advice I can give you. No, which 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 will probably work because the when this code, yeah, yeah, a little yeah. But so but before this code is deployed on the internet. Uh, you know, it has to be. It has to get into Debian stable, Ubuntu, CentOS. It will take a while. Only the people running uh, running hardcore, uh, top of the line name servers will will be impacted first. Do you have an estimate how many percent of the 
on the internet. Uh, I, I think it is the majority, but many of the CDNs run their own versions of things. Yes. <laughs> also, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it also, by the way, it is always a DNS problem unless it's not. But you know, it always is. Um, so, so check all your middle boxes and far Peter. No, not, not for big zones. Uh, my, sorry? A root is uh, NSD bind and some not, I think, as well. No. <laughs> But this is all, th so that is usually internal, uh, internal yeah. stuff, and um, your your resolver will probably deal with this properly. Yeah, it could. Uh, but so, like I said, uh, I'm going to tell you how you can test all this and uh, hopefully remedy it uh, before that happens. So. No. No. Okay. We n none of us are, are want to put this behind the flag because then people will will still yeah. uh, will still have crappy shit on the internet, and that, that should just go away. Um, so ch check all your middle boxes and firewalls. Uh, if you have a firewall appliance somewhere running uh, deep in your network or some DPI thing that 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 mangles the packets, uh, have a look at them as well. If you if you say if you have weird. Uh, um, Weird results on the on the tests. Uh, it might be that that it's interfering, uh, and then of course test your domains. So the the nice people of ISC have a website where you can just do this. Uh, you can also download the software, do a more complete test. Uh, but this this one just works. It's ednscomp.isc.org/ednscomp. If you uh, take away the slash part, it will give you a more of an overview page with some information. And statistics. Hmm? Statistics. and statistics. Yes, and you shouldn't look at it because it's. You, you, get, you, get, you get scared and it's sad. Um, so what does it look like? So of course I tested loaddays.org. Totally fine. Uh, supports eDNS, all the, uh, you, you even do it well if we send uh, eDNS version one and with options, without options, everything. Just well done. Do you know what it runs? <laughs> ah, okay. I, I, I recommend the uh, NF server. Okay. Probably something modern though. So if you look at Google.com, it's uh, all yellow. Um, fortunately for Google, these are not the things that will break, uh, but it might break in the future if we extend the e if we extend EDNS with other things, uh, and and we'll just enable these options by default. So um, coming February, Google won't have a problem, but maybe a few uh, few years later they might if they keep it up like this. And then there's like the severely broken stuff. So it's, it's not super readable. Uh, I will, like I said, I will uh, throw in the, the slides uh, online. Uh, but these people time out if you send an EDNS one query. So uh, with version one set, they just don't give a response. Um, if you send some EDNS options with version zero, doesn't respond. Uh, if you uh, if you send them uh, like an EDNS query over TCP, no response. But it, it, it does it does listen because it, it will time out. It doesn't uh, it, it doesn't refuse. But it won't answer. So this server will have trouble coming February. Yes. So if you see red, you have to fix things. If you see yellow, please also fix. But yeah. Uh, 
Um, it will have a problem if you send it an eDNS query that has an option set, in, in this case. Um, the uh, eDNS comp website will also give you information about what each check does, what it is, and what the dig command line for it is. Correct. But it, it, it does save us a lot of mental work yeah, yeah. To, to not have these workarounds. Um, so yes, and this is how we're going to force the internet to change. Well, and, and, and like I said, many of, many of the name servers on the internet are already pretty okay, uh, just have some weird weirdness. But in the future, we might remove more workarounds, like uh, there is RFC 8020, which says, if I get an NX domain, I know that there is nothing underneath in this whole tree. Uh, and there are name servers for, for instance, CDNs that will happily tell you, oh yeah, this is NX domain, when I mean, no, actually this node in the tree does not exist, but there's data underneath. Uh, and when those workarounds will be removed, then we will suddenly lose big parts of the internet. And it might, might be possible that we're going to do this within a few years. Sorry? Is DNS really in, uh, EDNS? Yes. 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 Any resolver that pretends so to. Okay. Yeah. No, so any resolver that pretends to do DNSSEC uh, must do EDNS, yeah. otherwise it cannot. Okay. Cannot do this. Uh, so I'm uh, running a little bit fast, but uh, I can answer all your weird DNS questions if you want, or I can have Peter answer them. <laughs> but in so in conclusion, uh, the eDNS, it is, enabled, uh, it is an enabling technology. You can do a lot of fun things with it, especially now that you can just create new options and just do weird, weird stuff on the internet with it if you want. Uh, some name servers just do the wrong thing. We get tired of workarounds, and we will just start removing them coming February. So please test your domains. Keep your name servers up to date. And if you have any questions, then please ask. And thank you for coming here, and thank you for Low Days for having me. Yes, well, fortunately, every big ISP that we know of has a support contract for their name servers. Also they yeah, yeah. And also, they, the is they, they their customers tell them, I need to go to this website of mm -hmm. a broken name server, and I can't reach it. And that website of broken name server is somewhere mm -hmm. else, but I can reach it on the government. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, so they will test. Uh, they will, of course, keep statistics on this, uh, and there is a, a long long road ahead and mostly ISPs have some weight to throw in if they go to a operator and says hey your domain is broken and this is why my customers and your customers cannot reach the site anymore so this is it, it is a little bit of a necessary evil to just yeah. make sure that that people are sticking to the standards yeah but the, the, the risk is that it might backfire it, it might backfire yes but in the we, we have run some tests and most of it looks good on, on the EDNS front we have run some tests, and most of the eDNS things look good. So you, you think it, it will backfire? I don't think it will backfire that much, at least not for the truly popular uh, domains. It might be these really tiny domains that run really weird homegrown stuff that maybe one person in, in right. the world will attempt to visit. And usually these people have enough technical knowledge to figure out what's going on then. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Uh, usually they they do. Yeah. So the. This is true. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. For instance, so it, the payload payload is one of the most important ones, especially with DNSSEC, because you just have larger answers because of the signatures. Um, but with the options that you can add as a uh, uh, as the person re doing the request, you can enable other things like so. Like I said, the chain one that people usually ignore, but it's quite an interesting idea. If you forward to another recursor, you can tell it, 
uh, please send me all the DNSSEC information uh, re related to this query. Also, the latest, the, my uh, lowest validated name I have is example.com, and please give me a.b.c.example.com. And then the, if the responder actually implements this, uh, this chain query, it will put all the information needed to validate everything in that, uh, in that name in the query back, which will save a few round trips, for instance. That is with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And and also this is between the the recursive resolver and the and the ah, client, yeah. not 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 outgoing. So just, just having the ability to negotiate payments, I don't necessarily make it to the attack. No. So for instance, uh, in the PowerDNS name server, and I believe all the other ones, um, we will set. Uh, you can set the maximum payload that you want to send to your clients, regardless of what your client wants. So if your client sends, I want 4K, and you have configured, I, uh, I will only send 2K, we will truncate the packet at 2K, and then tell the client, hey, um, our payload is 2K, and here's a truncated packet, please try again over TCP. And on the resolver to authoritative side, the same thing happens. So we can tell the uh, authoritative server, hey, we can receive 4K of data. And the authoritative server can, can say, well, let's not do 4K, let's just do 1,000 bytes. And uh, you will retry if I, if I send you the truncated packet. If it is a reflection attack, I will only send 1,000 bytes of data instead of the whatever you requested. So yeah, th these, these things are well known that, uh, that they can happen. Anybody else? Uh, large TXT records can, for instance, fit in there. Uh, but DNSSEC is the prime use case for eDNS at the moment. And I'm pretty sure people will come up with interesting ideas to, to fill either the payload or do, do weird things. Th uh, no, ED EDNS is not, uh, is not the hindering part of, uh, of DNSSEC adoption. Lack of the part, right? Yes, yeah. but, but, but now it isn't anymore. Now it's the unwillingness and uh, the scariness of crypto. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you.